Hi, my name is Nikki Lofton, and I am here today to talk to you about books and writing and scary stories and stealing fairy tales and making them your own. Um, I hope that you enjoy what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, if you are uh, easily creeped out, you can always skip the little part where I read from my creepy book. Now, I don't just write creepy books. I write books with magic in them. One of my books is Wish Girl. Another is Nightingale's Nest. And actually, um, this is a book that was based on a fairy tale, The Nightingale. It's Hans Christian Andersen's famous fairy tale, and you should read it sometime. Um, I also write short, scary stories. And uh, it all started with my very first book, The Sinister Sweetness of Splendid Academy. Now, if you know what sinister means, which you probably do, it means evil. So when people think about children's book authors, they probably think about sweet people who sit around thinking about darling young children and how they could write stories for them about puppies and kittens and unicorns. And you know, I actually don't do that. I do sit around thinking about young readers, young, sweet, easily traumatized readers. And how could I write something for them that would scare them? To, no, okay, maybe not that bad. In any case, um, Sinister Sweetness of Splendid Academy was my first book for young readers. And um, I'd like to talk to you about how you become an author a little bit and how I did that just really quickly. So when I was a little girl, I loved to read scary stories. In fact, I loved to read anything I could get my hands on even books I probably wasn't ready for. Um, there was a room in my house I wasn't supposed to play in. And in that room, there was a tall bookshelf. And on the very top shelf, there were these old, old leather bound books. And I thought, I've read everything else in the house. I wonder what's in those. And I climbed up the bookshelf like a ladder and took them off and realized I had finally found my favorite kind of story in the world. And that was fairy tales. Now, I know some of you are thinking about fairy tales and they're like, really princesses? No, yeah, okay, yeah, there are princesses, but like these were the original grim fairy tales, which are super, super gory and full of exciting things. And um, I won't talk about Cinderella because there's just way too much murdery goodness in that story. Um, but uh, if you ever read the original grim fairy tales, you'll understand what I was reading at a very early age. In fact, my favorite grim fairy tale was Hansel and Gretel. Um, it was uh, full of like the best things ever. Uh, you know, had like a little brother and sister and they get lost in the woods. Okay, they don't get lost. Their parents leave them there to starve and die. So it was kind of like a parenting manual. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, I, I read this story over and over because it had so much magic and candy and all of the stuff that I loved. And I decided um, these were the kinds of stories that I would spend my time reading. And I did. In fact, when I was little, um, I spent so much time reading that something actually happened to my brain. Do you see this picture? Do you see how the hair is poking out on the one side? That's because I read so many stories that my skull actually expanded. <laughs> no, again, I'm kidding. Um, this is just me. When I was uh, the age where I was reading the most, I read everything I could get my hands on. I read every book in my school library. And when you read that much, something actually happens to your brain. Um, if you stuff your brain full of stories, eventually stories will start to spill out. It will not look like a stack of books falling out of your brain. Um, it will look like what happened to me. I started drawing pictures and writing things in the corners of my assignments. I started writing anywhere and everywhere I could. And that was when I was nine or 10 years old, I realized I wanted to be a writer. Now, um, I did become a writer, um, which in, I tell people that it's a little bit like becoming a unicorn because I didn't realize it was something I could actually do. By the way, this is not just the head of a unicorn that I've like, like chopped off. This is like a unicorn mask that I wear whenever I need to write particularly awesome things. Um, so I went to, um, to school to become an author. And um, I went out in my life and I started doing this thing to be a writer. And I, I talked to kids all over the world about stories and how to tell them. And they always ask the same question, like at every single thing I've ever talked at, 
probably, which is where do your ideas come from? And I, they think it may be my personal experience, maybe my incredible huge brain, maybe my magic eight ball. And sure, those are some of the places I get ideas. Um, but actually, I steal my very best ideas. You see, like I told you, when I was a little girl, I loved reading fairy tales. And so when it was time to write a story, my first book, The Sinister Sweetness of Splendid Academy, I wrote the best novel I could. And then I sent it to New York and the editors read it and they said, my gosh, this is incredibly disturbing. This is horrible. What is the playground sand made out of? Anyway, and they, they said, can we buy this book? And I said, sure. And then they said, but we'll have to change a few things. And I said, what do you mean? Isn't it perfect? And they said, no, Nikki, if we don't change a few things, they'll know that you stole this story. You see, when I sold this book originally, the title was not The Sinister Sweetness of Splendid Academy. It was The Gingerbread School. And the main characters' names were not Lorelei and Andrew. They were Greta and Hans. You guessed it. This, my very first book, was just a stolen fairy tale, Hansel and Gretel. You see, Hansel and Gretel had everything that I loved about stories and fairy tales. It had all sorts of scary stuff and all sorts of amazing things and magic. And now I would like to show you how you can take a fairy tale and steal it and get away with it like I did. Now, the first thing that you have to do is pick a really famous story. Like I picked Hansel and Gretel. Um, you will have to think of a super famous story. And then I want you to ask yourself a question. Do you know the story very well? Like backwards and forwards, you know everything that happens in it, all the characters. Okay, if you can say yes to that question, then I want you to be careful before you go on because you might make a mistake like this. You see, this is a famous story, Barry Trotter and the Magician's Rock by Nikki Lofton. Uh, okay, you know what story this is. If you take a story like Harry Potter and you decide to steal it and publish it, you're going to get in terrible, terrible trouble. This is not the kind of stealing we're going to do. I don't want any of you to have to pay the price and go to jail. So I didn't really do this. What I want you to do is pick a famous story Ask yourself if you know it very well, and then ask this important question. Is the author of this story dead? Yes, dead. And I don't mean a little bit dead. I don't mean like they died last year. I mean, is the author of this story super dead? And that means that probably everyone the author ever knew is dead, their family is dead. In fact, the story was written or told so long ago that nobody is gonna come after you and sue you and take you and put you in author jail if you steal the story. Right, now think about the story you chose. Do you know it very well? Is the author dead? Like super, super dead? Great, okay, so what you probably have here is a fairy tale or a myth, or a legend, or a folk tale. And if you find that you have one of those, you're like, yes, actually, that's what I have. Then you're free to go. You're free to steal this story and get away with it like Goldilocks, all right? Now, if you've been thinking of a story and you've written that down, what I want you to do now is think about um, all the parts of the story. Now, Cinderella, obviously you know what this picture is, um, the glass slipper from Cinderella. Cinderella is one of the most famous stories in the world. It has been retold and published over 900 times. So if you pick Cinderella and you want to write something completely new and different, you're going to have some work to do. Um, but you probably know all the parts of Cinderella. You probably know the characters that are in it. You probably know the setting. You know all the things that happen. And that is a really important part of the story. However, there are quite a few characters in Cinderella. It's a very long story. The first time you do this, you might want to pick an easier story. You might pick something like The Three Little Pigs. Um, in The Three Little Pigs, it's pretty easy to break it down. What I want you to do first um, is make a list of your characters. So in The Three Little Pigs, you have 
three little pigs, right? And then you have a wolf, right? And that's it, yes? Right, so you have a very limited number of characters to work with, great. And everyone knows the story of the Three Little Pigs. You know what happens in the Three Little, wait, maybe you don't know what happens in the Three Little Pigs. You see, back in the old days, when people like me were reading scary fairy tales, the Three Little Pigs ended a little differently. Like, when the story was going on, um, in the storybooks that, that kids now are reading, the pigs live. Like the first little pig, the wolf comes and huffs and puffs and blows down the, the house and the pig runs to his brother's house. He survives. <sighs> Guys, seriously, there is no pig faster than a hungry wolf. In the original one, the pigs died. Well, not the third one, the one that built the brick house. That was fine. Okay, so you've thought about your characters. You've listed your characters. Now, think about your setting. In The Three Little Pigs, you have the three houses. It's probably in a village or in a forest, whatever your story is. So write down the setting. Now, think about the story. What happens? Not, not little details, but things that happen. Okay, the three little pigs have to build houses. One of them builds a house out of straw, one of them builds a house out of sticks, one of them builds a house out of bricks. The wolf comes along, blows down the house, blows down the house, goes after the brick house, cannot blow it down, comes down the chimney, gets cooked up, and I don't know, the pigs eat him, whatever happens in that story. If you can't do this exercise easily, you're probably going to need to choose a different story, right? Um, because if you can't think of what happens in the story quickly, then you need to choose something else. Now, have you chosen a story? Do you know what you want to write about? All right, so what you've done is you've chosen your story, listed the characters, written down the setting, and kind of mapped out what happens. Next, this is the important part. You need to figure out why you love that story more than any of the others. Because if you're going to spend all the time rewriting this, this fairy tale or legend or myth, if you're going to spend all of that energy and time making a new thing, stealing it and remaking it so that you can sell it and get a bunch of money or so you can turn it into your class and get an A plus and the teacher thinks you're the best ever or whatever your goal is, you're going to have to know what it is that you love about it and you're going to have to pick a story that you love. Now, when you think about that, it might be that you just love a character. You love what happens in the ending. You love the kind of magic, whatever it is. And then you are going to need to keep that thing. Even if you change other things in the story, keep that wonderful, magical thing that you love. All right, so you've done that too. Good. Now for me, when I decided to steal a fairy tale and rip it off and make a bunch of money off of it, I picked my very favorite fairy tale and I knew instantly what my favorite thing about it was. It was the candy. You see, when Hansel and Gretel went into the woods and found the witch's house, they were starving. They fell on the gingerbread house and they started eating it and tearing it up, stuffing it in their mouths. And it was the best thing ever to imagine that I could find a house made out of cake and cookies and candy and eat it and no one would stop me. Okay, well, you know, there was the witch. Um, I decided that was what I had to keep. I had to keep the candy. So when I decided to write The Sinister Sweetness of Splendid Academy, I thought the most important thing that I wanted to keep was that deliciousness where you just couldn't stop eating and eating all the wonderful things. Now, I had changed one thing. And the first thing that I changed was where it was. So it is at Splendid Academy, which is a school. Again, I had to change the names of the characters so that I could get away with stealing it. Um, so Lorelai is the main character, but I kept almost everything else the same. Um, Lorelai is Gretel and Andrew, her friend, is Hansel. And they find themselves at Splendid Academy, a brand new school that just popped up almost overnight in their neighborhood. And it's an amazing school and they're so excited to go there. And on the first day, Lorelai runs late. She gets there after breakfast and she finds that there are golden bowls of candy on all of the desks in the classroom. And she's just about to eat. And this boy next to her, Andrew, says, stop, don't eat. She's like, I'm starving. Leave me alone, you've got your own. And he goes, no, 
don't eat. I can't tell you why. The teacher's watching, Miss Morgan. But I'll tell you later. But he doesn't get a chance to tell her what's up until lunchtime comes. And then she sits down to lunch, starving, hungry, and her teacher is sitting at the table with her. And see if you can listen to this very short reading and see what I kept the same. Now, remember, in Hansel and Gretel, the father and the stepmother are um, not in the picture. In fact, the mother has died and they have this terrible, wicked stepmother. So that's the same in my story too. Here we go. Then the food arrived and I forgot what I was thinking about. I don't know how they'd done it, but they cooked every single thing that was on my favorite foods list. I've been making since kindergarten. Pasta with rich tomato sauce, fried chicken that smelled the same as my grandma's, mashed potatoes, carrot coins swimming in honey, and white rolls so fluffy they reminded me of clouds. Bon appetit, Miss Morgan said. Huh? One of the boys at our table looked confused. We're going to learn foreign languages too? <laughs> she shook her head, reached over, and handed him his fork. Dig in, she instructed, and we did. From the first bite, I was caught in a dream. Each bite was better than any school food, of course, but as I ate and ate, scooping the sweet carrots up, stuffing the pillowy rolls in my mouth in two bites, I realized this food was better than any restaurant I'd ever eaten in. Heck, it was better than anything my mom had cooked. The thought crashed into my brain like a boulder in a pond. Better than mom's? Nothing was better than her food nothing in the world. The fog lifted from my brain and I looked down. There were seven chicken leg bones on my plate and crumbs everywhere. Half eaten carrot coins spilling like crescent moons between the table settings. No one in the cafeteria was talking. The only sounds were chewing, swallowing, and occasionally a mumbled or, or yum. And then footsteps as the waiters came out again, bringing more food and still more. I was the only kid not eating. Aren't you hungry, Lorelei? Miss Morgan looked at me strangely. I put a hand on my bulging stomach and realized that yes, even after I'd eaten all that food, I was still hungry. I would die if I didn't get some more. I snatched up a half-eaten carrot coin and stuffed it in my mouth. Miss Morgan nodded, said, good, and turned away to look at the boy on her right. You're not eating enough, Zachary, she said. I might have kept eating if I hadn't seen Miss Morgan do what she did next. She reached out, pushed Zachary's sleeve up his arm, and encircled his bicep with her hand. She frowned. Zachary was really skinny, even though he was eating more than anyone else. Miss Morgan grabbed the butter dish from the center of the table and moved the entire stick of butter from the serving dish to his plate. And then, in three bites, he ate the butter, the whole stick, plain. Yum, he mumbled more. Miss Morgan snapped her fingers and a waiter scurried over placing another stick of butter on the serving dish and a new one on Zachary's plate. I gazed out on my own plate at my fork piled high and felt sick. I'm not hungry, I said to myself. I whispered it a little louder since my stomach was rumbling accusing me of lying. I'm not hungry. Not hungry? Miss Morgan's voice was harsh. A raven's croak. She cleared her throat. <clears throat> Lorelei, you say you're not hungry? No, I lied, my fingers twitching toward my fork. I'm full. But she's not full, is she? She'll never be full. She'll eat and eat because my favorite part of Hansel and Gretel is fattening, delectable, nutritious children. Uh, no, I'm sorry, um, uh, just slipping into my favorite story there for a minute. I got to keep my favorite part of the story. Now, you have to change something. You keep your favorite part, but you change something else entirely. And for me, it was the setting. Instead of Hansel and Gretel taking place in the woods, which was, in the old days, the scariest place that you could leave a child alone and defenseless, I decided now in modern times, we leave defenseless children all the time in the hands of strangers at school. And I decided that um, I would change that thing. Now, you can change the setting. You can change the time. Your story could take place in the past, in the future. You could 
have it take place on the moon, um, in outer space, in the center of the earth. You could have it take place in a magical world. You could have it take place in your kitchen cabinets. Authors have done all of these things and they're way fun to do. Um, you come up with lots and lots of ideas and you brainstorm all the places it could be and pick your favorite one. Um, you can also change uh, who tells the story. So instead of Cinderella telling your story, it could be the Wicked Stepsister. It could be the Wicked Stepmother. It could be Prince Charming. Whatever you want to do is fine. Um, you could even change a very small thing. And I'm going to give you one disgusting example. For example, in Rapunzel, a very famous fairy tale about uh, a man and his wife and they're having a baby and they uh the wife really wants some super awesome salad which is not really what i would always want it would be chocolate but salad and so the the husband goes to get it and it's a witch's garden of course and so they end up having to give their daughter to the witch she lives up in the tower she grows her hair down long the witch comes up all of that stuff and you probably know this story um so when the prince comes and he's listened in on the witch and she keeps saying, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your long hair. I thought I could change that story entirely by changing one word and only one word. What if what the witch and then the prince said was Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your nose hair. Yes, you see, it would be a completely different story. And I think it would make a great graphic novel. Anyways, if you can draw, draw that and send it to me, please. I would love to see that story. Now, when you change one thing about your story, lots of other things will change too, okay? Um, if you change one big thing, like the setting, um, you will have to change a lot of other things too. For instance, um, when I decided to change um, the gingerbread house in Hansel and Gretel to a school, I had one huge problem, which is... Um, <sighs> When you see a candy house in the woods, you run to it. You can't wait to get there because it is a candy house, right? But if you were just a normal kid and you saw a school, uh, I mean, okay, maybe some of y'all have gone to great schools and you absolutely love your schools and that's fine. But probably when I was a kid on a Saturday morning, the last thing I was thinking was, I wish I were in school. So I had to make something about a school irresistible. And again, my editors in New York told me it couldn't just be make the school out of candy because then everybody would know that I'd stole my story and I would never get away with it. So I decided what is on a school that I could make even better? Something that when you looked at a school, you would say, mom, dad, pull me out of my regular school and put me there today. And I figured out the answer was a playground. I decided that I would make the playground of Splendid Academy absolutely amazing. There would be rock walls and uh, zip lines and tree houses and every kind of playground equipment that I ever loved, even that really super dangerous stuff that we used to have back in the 70s. Um, I put it all there like a skateboard ramp, but it was so much fun. And I love just sitting around and brainstorming this stuff and coming up with it. And sometimes when I would run out of ideas, I would turn to my kid who was about 10, 10 years old at the time and say, hey kid, what else do you think should be on this playground? And he had great ideas too. So you can ask friends for great ideas, you can do it yourself. But when you come up with that idea, you need to remember that it exists in your mind. But until you change up the story and tell it to someone else, you're never going to really be able to put all the pieces together. So now that you've picked a fairy tale and you've thought about what you loved and you've sketched it out and you've picked one really big thing to change and then you think about all of the fireworks, all of the brainstorming, all the ways it will change the story and you've come to that together, then what you need to do is one of three things. You need to either tell someone else your story you need to draw your story. You can make like a comic strip or draw pictures of it or write it down. Now, if you write it down, you can go back in and revise it. If you tell it to someone, you can always tell it better the next time. And if you draw it, of course, that's why pencils have erasers. You can always erase parts and make them better. That's called revision. And all writers revise their stories. Um, even storytellers revise their stories as they tell them. Now, a few more notes before we go. 
make sure to add your own awesomeness. If you have a way that you talk that's funny, that can be your dialogue. It doesn't have to sound like everything you've read before. Don't copy someone else's stuff because, well, okay, yeah, kind of copy it. You can steal a whole story idea, but change it up enough so that you can get away with telling the story to someone else and having them be like, oh my gosh, you came up with that on your own. And you'd be like, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> Don't copy straight off of a story. Use your memory of the story. Use your memory of what happens in a story that you know very well to tell your new one and it will make it better. And remember this last thing, stories are Play-Doh. You can always, if a story's not going right when you start writing it or drawing it or telling it, you can always go back and start over. Just roll the Play-Doh back up, squish it together and start over. Or you can tear off a little part and change it. Change it as you go. And remember this, you're supposed to have fun. Writing is fun. I'm going to be honest. It's the most fun thing I've ever done in my life. To be able to come up with cool stories, some of which I just steal, and tell them to kids and to readers all over the world and have them laugh with me and have them be scared when they read it, that's amazing. So I hope you get started doing that right now. Take some time, sketch out the stuff I told you to, and have fun with it. Um, and speaking of having fun, the second most wonderful thing I do is read. And I would like you to support your independent bookstores. My local independent bookstore is a book people, and I buy books from them and have read some of the best stories of my life from there. Um, and I appreciate book people and independent bookstores all over, and I also appreciate Project Wise and the Writers League of Texas for making these videos possible. And if you end up writing a story and you want to share it with me, you can go to my website at www.nikkilofton.com and send me a picture of your story and I would love to read it. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Go out there, read, write, and have fun. <laughs>